make your fantasies come true. What else do I have to say? You just hold my hand and I can't stand up for a while till you're falling apart, falling apart like I'm falling for you. Greetings, Adams and Adamettes. My name is the Smalty Cynic. Today we're going to be talking about the early access launch of Adam RPG Trudograd, which is a bit of a mouthful, so I'm just going to say Trudograd for the sake of my health. But anyways, you probably have, well, <laughs> based on the view counts, it seems like a lot of people responded quite favorably towards the um, beginner's guide video I made on Adam RPG, and I did say I would cover this in the near future, so this is what we're going to be doing today. Um, just to make it a little bit easier, I will be talking about some elements that transfer over from the character creation system and the options menu, just to make it easier so you don't have to go back and check it. But for the general character builds and um, discussion of the stats, I'm going to leave that for that video. So if you want my thoughts on the game itself, go look at my small, uh, small review on the game. Um, I will warn you, it was a bit of it was a year ago I did it. It's at 720p and I had a crappy computer to work with so it's not gonna be as nicely polished as this footage which there is a little bit of hiccups due to DirectX 12 but I'll talk about that in a little bit um, but just giving you an FYI on why that footage may be a little bit off compared to this one but I digress so if you want my thoughts on that game I have that video if you want a beginner's guide or just a breakdown of how the game works or plays I have the other video on just that. It's um, I'll list them in the annotations. For this video, I just want to focus on the discussion of Trudograd, whether or not you should get it as a first-time player, um, as well as just for disseminating information for um, diehards who, if you don't know, there's a loyalty discount, so you can get the game for like around eight or nine dollars, your equivalent. Just just giving you an FYI. Um, but anyways, that's all the stuff I want to talk about at the beginning. So let's actually go into the options menu because there are a couple things I want to point out just like it in the other one. So as I mentioned in the beginning, I am playing on the DirectX 12 equivalent. Now I could be wrong, but I remember playing this not too long ago. So about like three weeks. Um, Adam RPG only allowed you to play at DirectX 11. And I think that's why a lot of these graphical changes and performance improvements are more noticeable to me because this is what I'm playing on uh, I'm playing the only the direct x12 equivalent here so that's the first thing that kind of stood out to me when I loaded up the game and I realized the, the game looks somehow noticeably better so that's what my I'm gonna assume um, just a couple things I want to point out here okay you can scale the UI that's one thing right it's in the game settings so for those of you who are wondering um, at our Adam RPG and Trudograd are Fallout 1 and 2 style games. Now what does that mean? They are both isometric CRPGs in the vein of Fallout 1 and 2. So you're going to have a lot of turn-based combat, slow turns, and overall very slow gameplay. So I would suggest bump bumping it up to around up here. For my equivalent, I've done this because I've noticed that the combat sequences are a lot shorter at the beginning. So I kind of want to see if maybe there was some combat animation improvements because that was one of the um, listed features with this game and they added a little bit of extra combat mechanics. But I'm just going to recommend that if you want the best experience, bump it up to at least 60 to 70% and you should have a much more playable experience. But the other things you can do here is the isometric mode. Now I featured this in the um, beginner's guide video and I'm not going to use it here but it is a nice thing to see that this feature, which was added by the Dead City expansion, I want to say, is implemented at the beginning of the early access release. So that's a good that's a good idea. I like that a lot of these improvements are just carried over, along with the other improvements that I'm going to point out when we get into the actual game. Now I've played roughly six to eight hours of the game thus far, which I've only visited four out of the five available areas to give you some idea of how much content I've experienced. I would say roughly there's about 10 to 12 hours of content right now if you do every single thing and you explore um, just one of the two divergent paths with the main story. So there's a decent amount for now, but in addition to that, there is also the 
option to play as a female character, which does have different encounters and different um, character interactions for the script. So don't just think it's the same thing. No, 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 no. As I pointed out in the beginner's guide, the characters will respond to you very differently. Most of them. Not every single one, but enough that it will make it meaningful. So if you're judging this game for value for money for right now, you have about 10 to 12 hours for one playthrough. And if you double that, you have a pretty much a good solid 20 to 24 hours. So give or take what you want to think about that. I think that's a much better value proposition than the original release of Atom RPG. Granted, I didn't play it at launch. I played it um, midway through the early access development at several points. So I at least have a rough understanding of how much content they added back then versus now. So if you're looking at it from that value proposition, you have my blessing to give this game. But as I'm going to explain in the character creation system, I would highly suggest if you want a more fulfilling experience, go play the original Atom RPG. But I digress. I got kind of distracted on my own meandering thought here. I was just trying to show you the options menu, which I pretty much did. Isometric mode I already took over that. The UI stuff I already covered that. Yeah, and you can map the controls. So everything that is available in the current build of Atom RPG is pretty much carried over here. So that's a step in the right direction. So now that I got all that meandering thoughts out of my mind, let's actually talk about the character creation system and why you should play the original game first before jumping into this. As much as I think newcomers may like a lot of these improvements. So one of the things that they did is that they implemented a feature from Fallout 1 and 2 to kind of help newcomers get accustomed to the build idea. Um, so what they did is they give you the presets for four characters. They're very differently um, built around different stats and they have kind of backstories that kind of give you some idea of what they're like. But you have the option to create your own from scratch. But if you completed the original game, you can actually import your save file from Atom RPG. Now I've already done this, so you can just see that it works. I didn't have to install the game to do this. I guess it just accesses my cloud saves to get that file. Or if I have it on my computer, it does one or the other. So you can do that to get your character. But I'm just going to kind of show you a little bit of the changes with the character creation system. Again, these are very basic, just to the point differences. Um, the characteristics and the skills, they're pretty much identical. However, there's one difference with the skills. You notice because you're starting out at level 15 and not level 1, you get 230 points to invest, which may seem a little overkill, but then you realize this happens. So yeah, in the original game, you can only boost your stats up to 200. I don't think you could go over 200 based on what I've played thus far. But in this game, you actually can boost your stats up to around 300. And the reason they do that is this new kind of, I guess you could call it the perks in a way, they're kind of like skill, the skill equivalent of Fallout perks. So every 50 points you reach a new milestone and they add something to your um, particular skill. For martial arts it adds a bit of a extra animation or combo attacks. For melee weapons it adds more experience and a chance to ignore armor. For weaponry it allows stocks and uh, attacking with stocks and handles of weapons as well as the other stuff that I just mentioned. Speechcraft um, can boost your dialogue rating. And each of these things have their own unique level up stuff, which I think is a really good idea. Because skills have always felt like, especially in Fallout 1 and 2, like arbitrary things to your stats. Because the stats here, or your characteristics, they didn't really deter. They felt kind of determined. Hey, let me try that again. So in Fallout 1 and 2, your skills felt a lot more based on these things here rather than the characteristics or the Fallout equivalent of your special stats. So I like that these skills are a lot more interesting to level up and that they give you some reward and some diversity to your build. So I would consider this system an overall improvement, especially if we're talking about just Fallout 1 and 2, where I felt the special stats or the characteristics in this game's case determined a lot less of your builds and your importance in the story rather than how much the skill points were. Now you have like a little bit of a wiggle room to make your characteristic traits matter 
and also your skills matter based on how much points you want to invest into them. So I think this system is a very easy to look, but a very important addition to this game. Now just like Adam RPG, in addition to characteristics and skills, you do have distinctions. Most of these are just the same as before. There are some little bit of rebranding. So for example, Lone Genius, this is that child prodigy trait that I pointed out. And the only thing that it changes is this one talent point per level that you get subtracted by. I'm imagining it's based on the abilities that we're going to talk about in a little bit, but I like that a lot of these traits, or sorry, distinctions, have slight buffs and debuffs to make them a little bit more interesting. I haven't checked them all to see whether or not some are terrible. So that at least addresses one of my biggest criticisms with the distinction system. So overall, nice improvement, not too much of a deviation from the previous game that it hampers your uh, original builds. And even if you import your character, which let me just show you, you can actually modify and change around these things. So you're not beholden to your original game. You can actually add distinctions, change your stats around. You can do whatever you want. So don't think that whatever you built in the first game, you have to stick with. You can modify it no matter what. So now that we got that done, we went over the character traits, the characteristics, the skills, and the distinctions. Now we're gonna go and talk about the abilities, which has a completely new system. One that I think actually works in this game's favor. So I know it's a lot of process, but just let's take it one bit at a time or one slice of the pie, so to speak. <laughs> so the abilities are kind of the follow equivalent of perks. And as I mentioned in the beginner's guide video, there are some things with the difficulty settings that will determine how many of these points you get, as well as what options are the most favorable to most players. What they decided to do is kind of overhaul the entire system from the ground up and make it a lot more balanced for all difficulty modes. At least I've not seen any modifiers for it, as well as just making them a lot more universal no matter what character you want to make. Now what do I mean? Well let's just look at the survival stuff. So you notice when I go into this one slice of the pie, I can choose any of these things. Doesn't matter what order. But what I have to do is I have to spend one of these on the bottom to unlock one of the options above. And it works the same way all the way up to level four. And you don't just get one. You can get as many of these things as you want. If I want an entire row of um, abilities, then I can most certainly have it. And the only thing you have to factor is how much of these you're spending per level. Because when you play the game, without the Child Prodigy trait, you get three per level. With the Child Prodigy trait, you get two per level. So this is a much more forgiving system, I would say, than the one in Adam RPG. And because it doesn't seem to be determined by your difficulty rating, it does make the experience a lot more universal no matter what option you want to choose for the challenge. And these types of things extend to every single main attack. The only one that's really different is the tinkering skill, which I think has a lot more practical use in this game. So you unlock a little bit of bonuses, but it also gives you, where is it? Yeah, so if you notice on this one, I can get to um, level two items. So the crafting system has gotten also a minor overhaul, but one that doesn't um, take away from your original experience. It just makes sure that if you're going to craft, if you're going to go into the crafting tree, you're going to be investing some parts of your build for that for that benefit. Now, whether or not it's worth it, I have not played it enough to be able to tell you. And honestly, it's probably a little too early in the game's development to know whether or not it's worth it. But I'm just pointing that out in case you're wondering, why can't I create all my stuff that I could before? Well, they changed everything, so that's why. So. As you can tell, it works with all of these parts of the pie chart, and it makes it just a lot more forgiving no matter what you want to do. So we've gone over the characteristics pages, we've gone over the abilities, and we've gone over the general progression. Now the question I suggested at the beginning and now I'm going to answer now is, should you play this game before Adam RPG? If you don't care about the story spoilers that they're going to spoil immediately at the beginning, then maybe. And here's why. If you played Baldur's Gate 1 or 2, you know that Baldur's Gate 1 started off 
at level one. And D&D at level one is unforgiving. So I can see the value in wanting to jump into Baldur's Gate 2 to get a sense of how the combat and the gameplay works before actually jumping into Baldur's Gate 1, as back afterwards as that may sound. And I kind of feel the same way about Trudograd, because this starts you off midway, if we're going to say 30 is the new level cap, this starts you midway into the game. So you have a better idea of what the gameplay is like, the overall difficulty of the game at a smoother yet still demanding level, and you have more flexibility to just experiment with your builds at a much later part of the game. So I can see the value in wanting to play Trudograd before Adam RPG. Now for those of you who care more about the narrative or for the overall RPG experience, I would recommend you start with Adam RPG, not only because it is a complete experience, but you get a much better progression system with the changes. Because while that game is unforgiving at the beginning, it is a lot more favorable than learning all these systems midway into the game and realizing you should have done something maybe two hours ago that you can't undo because that would require starting over. So that's my recommendation to play the original versus this version. Now they are standalone experiences, so you actually don't need either game if you want to play one versus the other. But I do think you would be doing a disservice to yourself and cheapening your experience that you might have had with this game because even from the get-go, it remembers most of the important quests and characters that you interacted with. So a lot of these names and places won't make sense to you unless you have that prior knowledge. So I've said my thoughts on that part, and hopefully when I chisel this down, it won't be too much of rambling. Now, because I played this game for quite a while, I did make several save spots. That way I can kind of show you different points of the game that I played. What I'm going to do first is jump to like a safe part should be number 28. Now for those of you who have played Adam RPG, you might notice things are a lot more chilly around here, and that's because this game takes place in Trudograd. If you completed the game, you probably recalled one particular scene where a certain companion decided to retire. And guess who's back with us? Yes. Hexogen has returned with our adventuring crusades to restore the motherland. So I figured he would be back here, but it's nice to see that he's in here right at the beginning. Just like old times. So you probably can tell that even though this game has the same engine, it looks a lot more detailed and overall a much better polished experience than the original game. And I say that after experiencing the uh, early access demo where the borders of the screen were blue and stuff. So <laughs> I probably have a more favorable opinion on this uh, state of the build. But anyways, what I wanted to do here to kind of just give you an idea of some of the changes and polishes that they've had is this little cutscene sequence here with uh, a character. Oh, he's not here yet. Okay. So what I need to do first is we need to rest up for a little bit. Okay. So when I go over here, there should be a small gathering. If not, we'll rest. Okay. So we just need to rest for a couple minutes. Well, since I'm here, I guess I'll talk about the UI. You've probably noticed this UI is a lot more slick and clean and Thank God, because it is such a, it is such an improvement over the original game. I'm not, I'm not kidding. Um, probably my favorite addition is the quests, which it looks a lot at first, but if you remember the original game, you had this kind of annoying system where you had to cycle the names that you wanted for certain locations, which didn't tell you where exactly they were. It was more so where the quest giver was, so that made it a little confusing. Now they overall, now they simplified the whole thing, so. They will tell you the exact quest and the location of that quest. So you notice with um, from Stalingrad with Lo or from not Stalingrad, from Solnitsnagrad with love, it's in the police station, Mikhailov's tavern, and the scrap quarter. So this is a much better improvement. Which if you read the actual quest log, it will actually tell you why you need to go there and who you need to find. So this is a much this is a vast improvement on the experience. You can also cycle between the maps, so another minor but overlooked benefit. And for right now, the early access release only has these five areas. I've only gone through these four, so just to give you an idea of how much time I've spent in these areas with the six to eight hours that I played. So let's go to the alarm clock, and I think I said it for three hours. Oops, wrong button. 
All right, good. He's here this time. So this is what I wanted to show off to kind of show you some of the extra little polishes to the RPG experience, which takes a lot of cues from Pills of Eternity, of all things. But I'm getting ahead of myself. In a place of the mechanic and his feeble imitation of someone repairing a snowmobile, now stands a small crowd. Cold and miserable, they're peering suspiciously at the auto sled, still partially buried in snow, and discussing something among themselves. So, where is this guy? What's this all about? Asks a short, mustached fellow, and you can do nothing but ask yourself the same question. Yeah, I think a repairman's brain is fried. He came to the office late yesterday and told everyone to meet here at this time. Well, here I am. Now what? Shrugs the portly lady in a faux leather coat. You again recall your last meeting with the grim mechanic, his depressed state, his queer request for rope and some soap, the frightening phrases he uttered during the chat. You don't know what to think now. You try to push your way through the small yet compact crowd to the front row. It isn't as easy as you thought. People are reluctant to shift their positions and even push back at times. Ow, my foot, screams a short woman in a fluffy shawl. What's the hurry, comrade? Says a plump senior citizen as he shoves you away. When you finally get up front, the annoyed voices fall silent. To everyone's shock, the snowmobile roars to life and someone suddenly burrows his way up out of the snowbank and stands tall. Believe it or not, it's the mechanic. But with one big difference, now the morose fellow is grinning from ear to ear. Oof! Ah! I did it! I finally did it! Hear that purr, ladies and gents? That's the sound of victory! At the sound of your voice, the man turns and waves. The crowd also switches its attention to you. You're here too. I'm glad you got to see this. You're the reason I was able to fix this baby. Remember me asking for soap and a piece of rope? Um, we probably haggled for that engine with Stanislaw, the traveling salesman, guess as a plump fellow in a beige jacket. Right. Stanislaw was in town to visit the public bathhouse and needed soap badly. He didn't have any money, though. Just some old junk to trade. A hunchbacked old lady in a woolly beret supports this theory. He was desperate to get a rope for his horse, too. I remember that, adds an old man in horned rimmed glasses. You've all got it right, says the mechanic, gently stroking the hood of his snowmobile. I traded the items for a new engine for the snowmobile and finally got a running. Now I'm going to keep my promise. I asked you all here so I could say my goodbyes. And I see quite a lot of you heeded my call. My ex is here. My boss. My colleagues. Let's say our farewells, he exclaims passionately, but also with a hint of sadness. But, but where are you off to then? Ponders a large woman in a faux leather coat. I'm off to have myself an adventure, laughs the mechanic, slapping the hot hood of his vehicle. Ask the boss to lend me this baby in place of my annual bonus. I'm going to ride it so I can ride it no more. Scaring animals, giving people a ride, and running over dirty northerners all the way. The man snaps a pair of goggles over his eyes, mounts the bike, and with a final, see you next summer, folks, rides away in a haze of unsettled snow. Now, for those of you who played the original Adam RPG, you probably realize that is a world of a difference with the translations. And I think the narrator actually helps the localization to make it a lot smoother for at least the English audience. Obviously, I can't tell you how it sounds in the other languages, but that is such an improvement. I think the narrator plays an important role in making the dialogue a lot more digestible for others. Now, not all quests have this um, level of detail and cinematic flair to it, but there is a little bit of these kind of peppered throughout the game that it does really raise the overall quality of the experience with just a simple addition like that. And as you probably noticed, they're structured much like the Pills of Eternity 2 dead fire cutscenes where they're not so much options for you to play around with, but more so little interactive cutscenes, kind of like an interactive storybook, which I think is the perfect fit for a role-playing experience. So that's why I kind of want to start things off by showing you that, just to show you how much the writing overall, which isn't limited to just those kind of cutscenes, 
but the interactions, the quest design, the uh, responses that your character has, they are much needed improvements to the original game. And it just makes the overall narrative experience much more gratifying. So one of the reasons I want to start here is just kind of show you the leveling up system. Again, it's the same thing as before. And because I have the Lone Genius uh, distinction, which it seems to have transferred over every single one that I've had in the previous game. So if you want a non-narrative reason to play the game, you won't get any of these four that I didn't shoot or I didn't unlock over my course of the journey. So you do need to get these ones, at least for right now, by playing the original game. Maybe there's going to be another way to obtain these, but, <laughs> you know, like Ghostly Protection, that's going to be a very useful one. So just consider that if you're going to play this game over the original, but I've already said my piece on that. Now, what I want to do here was kind of just show you my um, ability tree and how I kind of specialize things. So I went for a lot of these survival ones, probably a lot more than my other character, because these things are just going to be universal things that every build is going to want. So, such as health point increases based on um, your level. And in this one, I get an additional action point if I get to um, a certain threshold. So, it does give this nice tailored build experience. So that way, you don't feel that every character is going to be exactly the same no matter what stats you choose. So that's why I want to just focus a lot more on that in the beginning. So now that I've given you a bit of the taste of the writing improvements and the mechanical differences, I'm just going to show you one thing that may be a little off-putting, at least in its current implementation, for those who played uh, the first game, and it's the world map design. Now when I first came across this screen, it didn't bother me as much until I realized you can't go anywhere on the map by just cl simply clicking on it. What you have to do is click these designated waypoints. And at the beginning, you can only go to the scrap quarter. So it does, at the very beginning, feel linear. But it's actually a lot more non-linear than it looks. Because as I mentioned before with the quests, they're all over the place. And they're going to send you to these things in a mostly randomized manner. So you're not going to feel as linear or on rails as much as it looks like. And as you travel between instances, you might have the option of um, unique encounters. And I don't think... I think in the past game, you didn't have stealth play in these roles. You only had the survival, the persuasion, and that was it. So I do like that stealth is a lot more prominent, not only in these sequences, but also in those interactive cutscenes like the storybook I showed you earlier. So we're going to try our luck here. Okay, so we succeeded. Now I am going to show you at least one combat situation that I recently got to because it felt like the best demonstration of uh, one of the better quest designs in this. A lot of them are kind of like the mini adventures in the original game. So if you like those kind of quest designs, there's more of that in there. I will say that a lot of them are more grounded in reality than the, what do you call it, the absurd ones. Like I mentioned at the beginning, you can go into the first town and there's an instance where you could talk to a crazy old man who is being haunted by the pro proletariat demons and you need to banish the uh, capitalists in the... <laughs> you need to ca banish the capitalist demons in his head and send him into a pig. That was kind of the tone of the first game. So this one's a little more grounded in reality. And I say this while this woman, if you can't tell, she has turnips on her hands. <laughs> yes. They made it a character model where he has amputated arms and they have turnips on her hands. Why turnips? I don't know. Just crazy turnip lady. So it's not completely straight faced, but it is a little more grounded in reality than I would say the first game was. So just give me an idea that it's not all completely doom and gloom and or sunny side up in Russia. So I do like that it has a little bit of both things, but in more moderation. So one thing I want to point out as a potential negative or just something to consider in the future is a lot of these maps are very small and that's okay because these are densely packed maps but if they're going to add combat sequences or anything like that i do feel like that might restrict some of the uh encounters or encounter designs just something i'm throwing out there as a potential problem i haven't noticed it too much because a lot of the 
combat sequences besides one has been taking place on the overworld map and i think that's intentional i think they want to just start off with just these are the story areas and then you have the random encounters on the map which are a lot more better paced and better designed i would say but i just want to point out that potential problem in the future if you notice that the maps are a lot too small or if the maps are a lot more restrictive on how you approach combat situations it's just something that i'm considering as a potential problem but i just kind of want to point that out now now speaking of combat what i should probably do to give you at least a demonstration of it is let's just find some encounter on the overworld map and just show you how it how it works now in order to access these uh parts of the map you do have to enter these green zones which isn't different from how you left random encounter maps but it will might it it might actually make the game feel a little linear than I think most people think it is at the beginning but again there's no there's nothing to stop me from going from one area to the next as long as I've gone in the general direction of it so let's see if I can uh, run away here okay I'm actually having better luck than uh, before <laughs> okay this is like the fifth time I've tried this hopefully we can get somewhere. Alright, so let's just attack him so that way I can just show you it. I tried just making it a forced encounter, but oh well. Now one thing that I think is an improvement, and this is kind of possible in the original game, but there were a lot fewer instances of this, is that you have some pre-striking encounters like this, where you notice I'm not immediately in combat. And that's because I can actually take the lead on the combat front and attack the enemies. Or, if I play correctly or smartly, if I want to just rush to the exit, I can avoid certain encounters and just take only the targets that are in my way. So let's see if we can avoid encounters just like I described. So if this is kind of the encounter design where it's a lot more balanced in terms of giving the player more skill to avoid threats, I do think this is a push in the bet in the right direction especially when we're talking about gunfights or um boss situations but just for the sake of just demonstrating the combat i'm actually gonna go and just shoot the dogs so just like before it's just normal turn-based combat and it, uh, instead of getting a pistol they gave me this gun instead so i'm quite favorable to it Let's see if we can trigger all of them Well, unfortunately, I can only encounter these things one at a time because I figured rushing in there would trigger them all, but oh well. This is why I have plan B. So, to demonstrate the combat in a little more detail, I'm going to load up a save for a particular bank heist mission, which is one of the few interesting uh, encounters I've noticed in this game thus far. I've only really had two gunfights that were part of a quest or a unique instance. The other ones have just been the random uh, slavers and prisoners. So I would say if you are looking at this game for a combat focus experience, right now it's not really meant for that. What they've done thus far is focus a lot more on the script, the RPG systems, and the skill checks. But I'm going to at least show you what the combat is really like um, with this save. <laughs> well, okay then. I guess I should look for the owner. <laughs> well, okay then. I wasn't expecting that. Okay, there it is. <laughs> well, you don't find a wallet and a condom in, inside every day. So here, we're going to jump into the actual combat sequence. But before then, there's another one of those interactive cutscenes that makes it a little more interesting than just another heist mission. You jump in the car where your partners in crime are already waiting. Pencil, as usual, is upbeat, but the other two are visibly tense. Mika is tapping nervously on the wheel and popping his head out the window every few seconds. Loka, the lab assistant, is compulsively checking his magazine. All right, ladies and germs, the, the plan is simple. Mika will wait here for us. Me, Loka, our new friend, Pencil points at you, will go down to the basement where they stage the cockfight. There will likely be one lone guard at the entrance. We need to get rid of him quietly. Inside will be a couple more people at most. We take them at gunpoint, find them safe, Loha cracks her open, piece of cake. 
Pencil pulls three scarves from his jacket, tying one over the lower part of his face. He offers the other two to you and Loja. Better safe than sorry. Look, we've been through this before. If you hadn't been eager, you wouldn't have come. Pencil pops open the door. This is gonna be smooth like butter, I promise. Okay, enough dilly-dallying, let's move. He tucks his gun under his leather jacket and gets out of the car. With the scarves over your faces and guns hidden under your shirts, the three of you walk up the block and turn into a narrow side street. You walk fast for about 30 more meters before coming to a T-junction. A five-story house from the 50s towers above you, but the way is blocked by a handful of tumble-down shacks. Crap, uh, this was all open space just a week ago. These ant hills keep going up everywhere, Pencil swears. That five-story building, that's where we're going. The road to the left traverses a residential block. On the right area, lean-to shanties and medieval-looking spiked fences. You decide to go left. The locals vanish as soon as you approach. A cacophony of shutters closing and doors locking greets you from both sides. The only person moving in your direction is a shabby man carrying a big sack on his shoulders. The man is bent under his load, staring down at his feet. The distance between you gets shorter and shorter. Hearing your footsteps, he finally raises his head. At the sight of your masks and menacing stares, he quietly says, shit, and walks a little faster. Once you've passed, you hear him run for his life up the street behind you. You exchange a glance with your comrade and keep walking. You arrive at the entrance of the illegal cockfighting basement, where a lone guard is pacing back and forth. He looks bored and isn't much interested in his surroundings or his job. Pencil presses his index finger to his lips and ducks behind a pile of dirty boxes. You and Loja follow. The moment of truth, we have to get rid of this bump head and quietly. Pencil takes a quick peek at the situation and quickly ducks back. This part's up to you. Don't let us down. The doorway is hidden from the eyes of both passerby and the guard, so there's no need for violence. But getting there without drawing his attention will be hard. You notice a stone that is perfect for your need. You lob the stone in a long, elegant arc into a trash can on one side. The metallic rattle snags the guard's attention like a fish hook and draws him in. Gun at the ready, he goes to check out the noise. Once he's a fair distance away, you scramble across the alley. Halfway to the door, you pause to gesture your companions to follow. Soon, the three of you are at the door, blocked from the guard's view by a towering pile of boxes. Pencil gives you a silent pat on the back and winks at Loja, who's plainly nervous. The ironclad door is secured with a hefty padlock. Pencil scratches his head, unsure, but Loja, the lab assistant, needs only tinker with it for a minute, and the door is open. He turns to you. All set. Take a look and see what's inside. So as you've seen from that uh, cutscene, there's a lot of skill checks and skill checks within skill checks, which is a vast improvement on the system I'm before. I know I'm kind of gushing here, and it is a little bit of a fanboy talking, I'm not going to lie, but these differences and these improvements just stand out so much that I can't help but just go gaga over them. Now for the context of this mission, we were trying to do a heist with this guy, and he was supposed to be dead, but unfortunately... He's here. Again, for the sake, I'm just going to go through this quickly. Well, at least I tried. I wanted to see if I could actually sp pass through him. I will notice, and it's probably because we're starting at level 15, a lot of these skill techs are a lot higher than I think most people would recognize. I think a lot of them are around the 100 levels. I remember trying doing the dog one and it was like 80 something for the survival check. So just FYI, if you're trying to optimize your build, you're gonna have these little snags at the beginning and I think that's a-okay. So what we're gonna do here is try our luck and then pass a dexterity check. Haha. <laughs> yippee ki <-yay>, motherfuckers. <laughs> so now we have a proper demonstration of the combat, let's actually talk about it. Now this will be kind of a quick overview of the stuff I mentioned before, but for companions, you usually have a um, a selection of things to choose from, but these guys are completely 
rogue, so I don't have any ability to deviate their plans. So right now, let's focus on these guys over here, because I think this guy's going to go for me. Let's take a burst fire. Good. So, thankfully he threw a grenade and stunned him, so he won't be too much of a threat. No chance there. Okay, um... Injured. Slightly injured. Okay, let's go for him. Alright, he's almost dead. Now, because these aren't companions, I don't care whether or not they die or not. Right now, I'm just looking out for myself. Okay. He's probably going to die in the next turn, but oh well. Spoils for the for those who live. And because I have a SMG, I could actually shoot both of them at the same time. So, yeah, I could definitely say SMG is the kind of the way to go at the beginning. I guess the value of the long-range weapons is you get higher critical chances at a distance rather than this, but yeah, this is going to be much better. Oh, I thought he would live. Never mind. Okay, well, let me heal up. Oh, wrong one. Oh, I'm out of bullets. Never mind. Okay. So thankfully, I already have my medical stuff equipped. So this is going to be helpful in this situation. And you noticed, I haven't talked about this yet, but one of the things they added to the game is the butt stroke option. <laughs> no, it's, it's not a euphemism for something. Basically, you can use your weapon to knock enemies out in a melee combat. So... Now we actually have melee combat for weapons, which I think is, I don't know how it's calculated, but that's a very nice thing. I imagine it could be used to knock them over or something. If not, that'd be a good idea to kind of make it more valuable. But just like before, we want to focus on the um, people with guns first because they're our highest threat, and then we worry about everyone else. Oh crap, I don't have ammo. Alright. Okay, well, since I'm gonna take a hit, I need, I need to take this. Okay, not that kind of hit. Alright, well, since this guy's about dead, let's finish him off. Let's get back and let him take some of the hits. I meant to do an aim shot, but oh well. Alright. He's dead, at least. So, the general strategy is the same as before. Lure them towards you, and then take care of the rest. He's not going to live, is he? Crap. Um, we'll try our best. Let's take an aim shot. It's hoping to blind him. I guess I should have went for his eyes. Oh well. Oh well. We're going to be the lone survival here. Just think of it like the uh, Fallout story, right? In this situation, we're actually doing fairly well because I'm not getting hit all that much. And I'm able to mitigate most damage. I say most, but I'm absolutely dying here right now. Now, I kind of wish I saved the rest of them, but... This is one of those situations where if I came better prepared, I probably would treat this a lot differently.
Good. Now he's blinded. We're good. Oh, he's about to kill me. <laughs> Maybe not. Maybe not so good. Alright. We managed to barely get through that. So, this is on normal. <laughs> Just to give you an idea. I know I already outlined this, but difficulty doesn't work as the way you think it is. Almost all the difficulty modes are practically the same as far as damage scaling. So the only difference is how much experience you get and the chance of random encounters. That's really the only big difference. But just consider this as a nice lesson of how to do combat and, well, get through it on your own. Oh, crap. I just realized it. I lost the format. God damn it, I might have to redo this. Well, shit, maybe he has something on his body. Well then, I guess this is a valuable reason why you want to keep your companions alive. All right, well, lesson learned. Now, I'm not going to replay this for your benefit, but I figured this was a good demonstration of just the combat mechanics, the story, and how the quest design works. Obviously, as you can tell, I could crack the safe on my own, but I do want to know what happened, so I'm going to try this again later. But anyways, I think this is a good enough demonstration of a game thus far, so Make of it what you will. I've already said my thoughts on both games, and you can check those videos out if you want. But anyways, I think this is where we're going to wrap things up. So, thanks for watching. If you would like more Adam RPG content, I will be posting my non-commentary video footage of this, because I at least wanted to get a non-rambling thoughts playthrough of this recorded, so that way I can kind of use any footage that may find in the future. But until we get at least to the halfway point, or to the final finish line of this game i'm not intending to do a video review on it so this video will be something of a placeholder on my thoughts on the game overall very good job and a vast improvement to the early access release of adam rpg which is a thing that we should consider for most developers to be honest i'm not trying to belittle this accomplishment but it is a really impressive job nonetheless anyways i've already kind of said my thoughts on this game so thanks for watching and catch you later Like I'm falling